All right, everybody, welcome. My name is Bronwyn Strong. Welcome tonight for Exploding Stars in You, The Origin of the Elements um, with Mike Seeds. Mike, we're so happy that you're back with us to share your knowledge and expertise with us. I can't wait to learn more from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brahma. Uh, I think I have to get my slides up now. This is always exciting because I'm never sure it's going to work. There we are. I think that worked. Good. Um, I want to talk to you about the origin of the atoms. And I want to make sure you understand that I don't care about electrons. Uh, electrons are like sofa pillows. They come loose really easy. They get shuffled around and traded and lost and, and so forth. I'm really talking about the atomic nuclei. Where did they come from? And you've probably heard or you've read that the atoms, the atomic nuclei were made inside stars and some of them were made inside exploding stars. This is a picture of what's left after a massive star exploded about 350 years ago. Um, this is a supernova remnant. It's what's left. And it's about uh, 10 light years in diameter and about 11,000 light years away. So it's a long way away, but it's still inside our galaxy. And these, this cloud of gas is um, expanding and it's rich in elements that this star produced um, during its lifetime and even as it exploded. So we're gonna talk about the atomic elements. It would be a reasonable suggestion for you to say, well, the atomic nuclei are eternal. They have always existed. Um, they've been around forever and they will be around forever, unchanged. But look at this element. This is a, a little specimen of autonite. Uh, this is about a quarter of an inch in diameter. I collect microscopic minerals, so all of my minerals are really quite small. This yellow stuff is autonite. And look at the formula for it. There's a U in the formula, and the U means uranium. So this mineral contains uranium. And uranium has a half-life, I wrote it down down here at the bottom, of 4.68 billion years. So in 4.68 billion years, half of the uranium atoms in this specimen will have decayed into something else, lead or a bunch of other possibilities. Uranium goes away. So if the atomic nuclei were eternal, then the uranium would be gone. There wouldn't be any radioactive elements. These uranium atoms must have been made within the last 10 or 20 billion years. Otherwise, they'd be gone and we wouldn't see them. Something is making atomic nuclei in the universe. And we know it because there are radioactive elements around. I want to show you this mineral. I'm going to illustrate my talk by showing you minerals. And they're all small. This hole here, it's called a vug in a rock. This little vug is about a millimeter in diameter. This is tiny. I took this picture through my microscope. And these filaments are crystals of this element called kersutite. Nothing really special about kersutite except that look at the list of atoms in kersutite. Sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, titanium, silicon, more aluminum, and oxygen. That's atomic goulash. All of those different atomic nuclei must have been made. There are processes that make them, and we're going to talk about how the atoms got made. In order to do that, we're going to have to talk about the life of stars, and that means I have to tell you a little bit about astronomy. And so I'm going to give you an astronomy lesson, and I know you're all science people because here you are logged into uh, this program. Um, so for you, the, the astronomy program only needs to be about one minute long, and it starts this way. We are here. This is the Earth. 
It's 8,000 miles in diameter. It's not very big. 8,000 miles, that's the scariest number I know because you and I are trapped on this little planet with a bunch of crazy people and we can't get off. So we've got to take care of it. This is a little planet. It goes around the sun, which is kind of a humdrum star. It's, it's, and it, it's just a star. There's nothing special about it except that it's ours. Um, it's 109 times bigger than the earth. It's made of gas. There's no solid, there's no liquid. It's mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and it's gas from its surface right down to its center. Um, and it's hot, you wouldn't wanna sit on it. I put this slide in just to remind you that there are other planets going around the sun. This is a stupid diagram. Uh, as a teacher, I think these diagrams should be illegal. They're hopelessly out of scale, but at least you can see that the Earth is a small planet. Um, the four inner planets are kind of rocky and the four outer planets are uh, actually liquid with uh, thick gas on the surface and Pluto isn't a planet. I knew the man who discovered Pluto and he was satisfied to say Pluto is not a planet. He thought that was kind of cool. So I agree with him. It's clearly not a planet. Um, this is our Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, actually, it's not our Milky Way galaxy because nobody has a selfie stick this long. Um, this is the Andromeda galaxy. It looks like our galaxy. And if we could get off and go out there and turn around and take a picture, this is what our galaxy would look like. And the sun would be out here about two thirds of the way to the outer edge. Um, Estimates are that our galaxy contains about 300 billion stars, more or less. I read a paper just recently that said, no, no, it's 400 billion. Well, whatever. I don't know. Three, once you pass 200 billion, it doesn't matter much. That's a lot of stars. I wanted to show you this picture because it's an interesting uh, picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. They pointed the telescope at a little spot on the sky where other telescopes on Earth could see nothing. It was an empty field. There were no stars there that were visible at all. And they took a time exposure for 11.3 days. That is a very long time exposure on this empty spot. And when they looked at the picture, they discovered that that empty spot contained 10,000 galaxies. Every spot on this photograph is a galaxy, except this one down here. That's a star. That's a real faint star that's just in our galaxy and it's in the way. And there's another one here. That's a star. They're like specks on the windshield. Ignore them. They don't belong here. The rest of these things are galaxies. If there are 10,000 galaxies in this little spot on the sky, then there must be roughly 2 trillion galaxies in the whole sky that we can see with the telescopes we've got now and we're building better telescopes so we'll see more all right i read a paper recently that said no no it's not two trillion it's one trillion all right big deal i don't care that's a lot of galaxies and every one of them contains about 300 billion stars look at every spot here See that one, that's a galaxy, 300 billion stars. That's a galaxy, 300 billion stars. That little one right there is a galaxy, 300 billion stars. Can you see that one there? It's really faint. It must be very far away, 300 billion stars. People ask me if I believe in life on other worlds. And I say, are you kidding me? There's two trillion galaxies visible now with the telescopes we've got, and each of them contains roughly 300 billion stars. And we're learning that half of all the stars in the universe have planets. So there must be a heck of a lot of planets in the universe. And you think it might be possible that the Earth is the only planet in the universe where there is life? Nah, life must exist on lots and lots of planets. It may not be intelligent on, on many planets. Um, intelligent life is probably um, 
uh, more unusual than just grass and trees and birds, but yeah, life must be very common in the universe. Now, I wanna mention that stars are born from clouds of gas in space. Of course, stars aren't alive, but astronomers talk that way because astronomers form from these clouds of gas. Um, a blob of gas will get a little bit denser than its neighbor and its own gravity will begin to pull it together and it'll form a denser a blob that will pull itself together and get denser and denser and it will give birth to a cluster of stars. And here's a little cluster of stars there that must have formed recently. And this blob is probably giving birth to more stars right now. Those stars produce atomic elements, atomic nuclei. And when they die, they spread them back into space. They're kind of like dirty smokestacks blowing stuff back into space. And that stuff gets mixed into the clouds of gas and new stars form that are contaminated with those heavy elements. And so generation after generation, the stars are making heavy elements. And when I say heavy elements, I mean heavier than helium. And about four and a half billion years ago, a cloud of gas became unstable, gravity pulled it together, and it settled down into a disk. Um, and the sun began to form at the center. They call that the solar nebula. And some of the stuff cooled off and stuck together and made pebbles and blobs and boulders and planetoids and stuff like that. And gradually it all settled down and the sun became really bright and planets formed in that disk. There's a planet forming right there and there's another planet forming down here. And when the sun turned on, finally it blew the remaining gas and dust away and we are here. So that's where the earth came from four and a half billion years ago. It formed with the sun from one of these clouds of gas and dust. So it incorporated some of those elements heavier than helium that had been made in stars. So we wanna tell the story of where those atomic nuclei came from. And I wanna show you this graph because this graph is in every astronomy textbook in every college in, in the country and students cannot figure it out. I know, I know, because I taught astronomy to freshmen for 32 years. They look at this and they scratch their heads. This is the relative abundance of the atomic elements according to atomic mass number. There's hydrogen up there. There's helium. There's carbon and some atoms kind of like carbon called the carbon peak. And then over here is iron and a few atoms kind of like iron. And then down here are all of the elements heavier than iron like that. This is hopeless. Students can't figure it out. So I typed all of this data into an Excel spreadsheet and I asked the Excel spreadsheet to plot the same diagram for me with a linear axis. This is, a, this is an exponential axis. What in the world does that mean? I said, make the, make the vertical axis linear so that we, we can figure out what it means. And this is what it looks like. Now we can understand what's going on. Here's hydrogen up here. There's helium in the universe. Quite a lot of helium compared with the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. There's the carbon peak. It hardly makes a dent. And there's iron peak out there. That's one pixel high. Every other element that exists is less than one pixel high in this graph. And we're made out of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, so we are here. That little bump is us. That's what we're made of. So we have to figure out why the other elements are so rare, why there's so much hydrogen and helium. And we're going to use this diagram. This is a periodic table. Chemists use this. Um, astronomers don't use it so much and I get confused trying to find things in here because I don't think like a chemist. I ignore the electrons. Valence means nothing to an astronomer. Most of the atoms in the universe are much too hot to have any electrons at all. But we're going to use this. There's cobalt, there's copper, there's carbon and nitrogen. Hydrogen is up here. 
and here's helium over here. So we're going to use this to kind of keep track of the atoms as we as we talk. And we'll start with the Big Bang. I'm going to dismiss the Big Bang in about 30 seconds because we don't have time to discuss it in detail. It is very hard to explain, so we use a cartoon. But when the universe began, it was very, very hot and very dense. It was so hot and so dense that for the first few minutes, hydrogen could fuse and make helium. But the universe was expanding and it was cooling and getting less dense. And so after about three minutes or so, give or take more or less, three minutes, the density and temperature fell to the point where those nuclear reactions couldn't work anymore. So if you start with hydrogen and a model of the universe, it predicts that about a quarter of the matter became helium. And that's what we observe in the universe. The helium was made in the Big Bang but almost nothing else was made in the Big Bang. And this is why. If you start with hydrogen, you can add a neutron and get heavy hydrogen, deuterium. You can add another particle and get lightweight helium and another particle and get normal helium. That's normal, that's balloon helium. You buy that in little aluminum balloons. And then you add another particle and you Oh, there's, there's no atomic nucleus, no stable nucleus with atomic mass five. There's a gap. This has to happen during the first three minutes. It has to go fast. There are slow processes that can make elements, but, but they're so slow, they don't do anything in three minutes. So boom, 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 boom. This has to work fast, but there's a missing step. And nature can't get past that step, so it can't make lithium. Somebody said their favorite mineral was lithium. It's a special, it's a really a special uh, element. There are a few really funny, weird, accidental ways to make a few lithium atoms during the Big Bang. And then you could make heavy lithium and then uh, there's another missing uh, nucleus. There's no stable nucleus of atomic mass eight. You can't get past that you can make almost no beryllium at all in the, in the um, Big Bang, can't do it. So the Big Bang was able to produce hydrogen and it was able to make some helium, but almost nothing else. The rest of the atomic elements had to be made in stars. And we'll start by talking about sun-like stars, stars like the sun humdrum medium mass stars, not real massive, not low mass, just humdrum stars. Here's a diagram that shows the sun. And uh, it's very hot in the center and nuclear reactions go on in the center and the heat comes flowing out to the surface, keeps the surface hot and the heat radiates away as light. This supports the sun, because the sun's gravity is trying to pull all of this gas in toward the center, but it can't flow in toward the center because all of this energy is rushing outward. And so the weight of the gas is balanced by the flow of energy out of the sun. And astronomers say that the sun is supported by the flow of energy outward. And the nuclear reactions that go on in the sun are the simplest of all, fusing hydrogen to make helium. As the sun gets older, it will become a giant star and it will fuse helium to make carbon. But all of these processes occur in the centers of the stars and the atoms are trapped inside the stars. So we have to find ways to get the atoms out of the stars. And that's the fun part because that's where you blow up stars. So here's a star. Uh, that is like the sun, but it's older. When the sun gets older, the core will run out of hydrogen. It'll be a helium core and it will contract and it will begin to fuse uh, helium to make carbon. 
and the outer part of the star will expand and become much larger and, and less dense. And the sun will become 10 to 100 times bigger than it is now. And um, the surface of the sun will at that point be out here about where the earth is. So this, by the way, will destroy the earth. It will blow the surface, it will vaporize the surface of the earth, probably vaporize the entire crust of the earth and blow it out into space. And then it will absorb the earth um, completely. These stars get so big that they lose control of the gas at the surface. Gravity becomes very weak at the surface because the surface is so far from the center where most of the mass is. And the pressure of energy flowing outward, photons of light pushing outward, begin to push the gas outward. And these stars lose control and the outer parts of the star get blown outward to form nebulae. This one is called the spirograph nebulae. You can see why. That's one of the ways that atoms get blown back out into space. And once you rip the surface off the star, the core of the star loses energy so fast it collapses and it becomes a white dwarf. And we're going to talk about white dwarfs in a little bit. Those are, those are interesting little beasts. The bad news is this will destroy the Earth. But the good news is it won't happen for a few billion years. So we have plenty of time. Notice the diameter of this thing. I look at my little note down here to me and it says this is 2.6 light years in diameter. This is much smaller than a supernova remnant. When a supernova goes off, it is a huge explosion. This is not an explosion. This is a little poof and it blows stuff out into space. These nebulae last only about 10,000 years. They get mixed into the uh, into the interstellar gas and dust and uh, this is called the cat's eye some of these nebulae are really pretty um, they're called planetary nebulae for the stupid reason that through a small telescope they look like planets well they have nothing to do with planets uh, there's lots of these in the sky because this is the way medium mass humdrum sun-like stars die. And there are lots of medium mass humdrum sun-like stars around. So there's lots of these little nebulae in the sky. I think there's about 1500 of them cataloged at present in the sky. And they're pu pushing atoms back into space. What kind of atoms are we talking about? You can find astronomy books that will tell you that the sun will not be able to make anything heavier than carbon and a little bit of oxygen, but that's not true. The nuclear reactions that make carbon require a certain temperature. The sun can't get hotter than that. It's not massive enough, so it can't fuse carbon. But it can make oxygen in a kind of side reaction. And there are other little sneaky side reactions that can make other atoms. And so the sun will produce lead well, that's hmm, lead, that's a pretty common atom. And carbon, somebody said carbon is their favorite atom. Yes, it is. And nitrogen, we all depend on nitrogen. We need nitrogen to dilute all that oxygen. Otherwise, I don't know what would happen to us. And strontium, I need strontium because strontium makes really pretty minerals. And I'm gonna show you some pretty minerals and molybdenum and barium and titanium and some other atoms. So the sun can make these atoms and when it, when it gets old and becomes a giant star and poofs its surface into space, it will blow this stuff back into space. Now we can look at our periodic table. Look at this yellow box at the bottom. It says dying low mass stars. That's what we're talking about. Stars like the sun, they produce planetary nebulae and there's a little picture of a planetary nebula there. Look at the atoms up here that are color coded yellow. Those are the ones that are produced in sun-like stars. There's carbon and nitrogen. And, um, and what else do we get? There's cadmium. There's mercury. The sun can make some mercury and titanium and lead. We said lead, yeah. And look at all the yttrium the sun can make. That's kind of weird. And barium, all kinds of, all kinds of that. And look over here. 
lithium. More than half of the lithium in the universe is made in stars like the sun. A little bit of it can be made, and notice it's color-coded blue, a little bit of it can be made in the Big Bang. And this, this rectangle down here that's labeled Big Bang Fusion is blue. And sure enough, hydrogen and helium are blue, a little bit of lithium. But most of the lithium in the universe is made in stars like the sun. Let's look at our list of atoms again. I wanted to show you some minerals. Um, I collect minerals. So when I think about atomic nuclei, I immediately think of rocks, of minerals. And these are all micromounts. This is wolfenite. I should have asked if anybody collected minerals, because if you collect minerals, you know wolfenite. Wolfenite forms plates, beautiful little yellow transparent plates. But this comes from the Great Southern Mine in Arizona, and the wolfenite has formed needles. I don't know why. There's something weird about the Great Southern Mine, and the wolfenite there forms these needles. They're really pretty. Look at the formula. There's lead, and there's molybdenum. They need a little bit of oxygen, but the sun-like stars don't make oxygen. It's lead and molybdenum. So when you see wolfenite, you're looking at minerals that were made mostly, partly, in sun-like stars. And here's why I need strontianite. Uh, strontium. Strontium is an important constituent in strontinite, which is strontium carbonate. And this little cross is about one millimeter in diameter. I found it down in a bug, in a hole, in a rock uh, under my microscope. And I think it's one of the prettiest specimens that I own. It's really pretty. Strontianite is not unusual. It's not rare. It's really uh, a common mineral, uh, and it's really pretty stuff. And we can thank sun-like stars for making the strontium that we need uh, to make strontium. And I wanted to show you this. This is cerusite. This is a micromount. This little box is about one inch square. And there's a crystal there that is mounted on a brush bristle. This is a bristle from a hairbrush. And the woman who mounted this, her name was Vi Anderson. She was a Canadian micromounter, very famous. She's in the, she's in the Hall of Fame, as a matter of fact. Um, she made beautiful, beautiful micromounts. And there's a little crystal of cerusite. And cerusite is lead carbonate. And lead and carbon are made in sun-like stars. And there's the little crystal that she mounted, tiny little crystals, really pretty under a microscope. Here's our list of, of atoms that are made in sun-like stars. Uh, lead, well, you don't have lead in your body. Uh, we don't want lead in our body. It does things. Uh, but we need it to, use, to make batteries and pigments and things like that. 18% of the weight of your body is carbon atoms. Carbon is very common in your body. And 3% is nitrogen. Nitrogen is a common constituent of organic molecules. If you remember organic chemistry from high school or college, you, uh, you know the, how common nitrogen is in organic molecules. Strontium, you'll find strontium in your bones. It's like calcium, it, it, chemically, very similar to calcium, but your body doesn't need it. It is not an essential element. You take it in with food and your body thinks that it's calcium and sticks it in bones, but you don't really need it. It's not poisonous or anything, um, but it's not an essential element. So you don't need strontium supplements in your diet. You don't need that. Molybdenum, is actually, that's a weird element, isn't it? It's hard to say. It's actually used to make enzymes in your body. You don't need very much of it and you get it from what you eat, but it is necessary. Um, we don't have much barium or titanium in our bodies, um, but we use it to make paint and glass. <laughs> and if you've ever had unpleasant x-rays, they might've given you barium stuff that you have to drink. I'm told it's awful. Titanium oxide makes wonderful white pigment. And if you own a house that's white, 
or a barn that's white, it's probably painted with paint that contains titanium oxide. They put it in toothpaste. It's not good for you. It's not bad for you. It doesn't do anything except titanium oxide makes toothpaste white. I guess they think it looks better if it's white. Let's talk about massive stars now because massive stars get violent and, and violent, we know from television is always interesting. By massive stars, I mean stars that are eight times more massive than the sun or more. And you might have stars up to 40, 50, 60 times the mass of the sun, really big massive stars. They age the same way as the sun, they fuse hydrogen to make helium, they fuse helium to make carbon, but they're so massive that when they contract, they can fuse carbon to make other things. And then they can fuse those other things and they can keep going, fusing one element after another. And when they do that, they get really, really big, a hundred to a thousand times the size of the sun. These things become very large. You know some of these supergiants if you know Orion. Betelgeuse and Rigel are two bright stars in the constellation Orion, and they're supergiants. Here's an internal view of the core of a supergiant star. This is just the core. It has fused hydrogen to make helium, helium to make carbon, carbon to make other things, if silicon fuses, sulfur fuses, it can even fuse neon. All of these elements fuse one after the other like a layer cake and in the center, it finally produces iron. And iron is a scary atom for a star because iron is the most stable nucleus. You can't get energy out of any nuclear reaction that starts with iron. It's a fuel that won't produce energy for a star. And when one of these supergiant stars produces an iron core, it's in big trouble because the iron core is eventually going to collapse. And when it collapses, it collapses in a fraction of a second. And that triggers an explosion that blows the star apart. I showed you a picture when we started of what's left after a supernova explosion. Here's a supernova in, in process. This picture on the left shows the galaxy before the supernova, and this shows the galaxy when the supernova was exploding. These supernovae can leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. The core of the star can collapse into a black hole or a neutron star. But the outer part of the star with all of those nice elements that the star has made over its lifetime gets blown out into space. Well, thank goodness for that, because it makes a lot of elements that we enjoy having. This is the Crab Nebula. You might be familiar with the Crab Nebula. You can see it with a small telescope. Um, it's an explosion that occurred in 1054 AD. The Chinese wrote it down. Uh, they saw it, thought that was really peculiar, and they made some notes about it. Uh, people in Europe, never saw it, or if they did, they didn't write it down. I guess in 1054, people in Europe were busy doing other things. I don't know what. They didn't have television. I don't know what they were doing. These massive stars produce supernova remnants. Notice the Crab Nebula is about 11 light years in diameter. That's much bigger than a planetary nebula, about five times bigger. It is a huge explosion, one of the biggest explosions in nature and it blows all of these new elements back out into space. And if you use a telescope with a spectrograph and you look at the spectrum of the gas here, you can see the elements that these supernovae have are blowing back into space. And here's a list of some of those elements. By the way, I'm, I'm being careless about one thing and I wanna confess it. I'm referring to these as R process, rapid process nucleosynthesis. Some of these are cooked up slowly inside the star before it explodes, and some of them are made during the explosion itself. I don't want to get into all that detail. Uh, we'll just call them R process. They're different from the atoms made uh, in sun-like stars. Those are made slowly, like 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 a slow cooker on on in your kitchen. 
these are made when the star explodes or, or in the star before it explodes. Look at all these nice atoms. Um, uh, Bronlin said her favorite atom was oxygen and I smiled to myself because I know how oxygen is made. For that matter, uh, I kind of know how most of these atoms are made. So I was smiling when you named lithium and hydrogen and so forth as your favorite elements. Yeah, they're, they're cool. They're made in interesting ways. Sodium, magnesium, oxygen, aluminum, huh, aluminum. Aluminum is my wife's favorite element because she likes turquoise. Um, potassium and phosphorus, arsenic. Well, I'm not so fond of arsenic, um, selenium, copper. Somebody said they liked copper. Somebody from Michigan, of course. I have mineral collecting friends who collect copper and we refer to them as copper nuts. They're nice people and we like them, but they collect copper all the time. And, and so we think they're copper nuts. And silicon. Most rocks are made out of silicate. So yeah, rock collectors like silicon. And there are other atoms that I didn't list here. Let's look at our diagram. Exploding massive stars are shaded green. This teal green, let's look at some of these. There's oxygen at the upper right and fluorine and neon. Remember I said the stars make neon? And uh, what else is here? Uh, there's, there's sulfur. More than half of the sulfur in the universe is made by exploding stars. There's aluminum. There's gallium. I don't care much about gallium. Well, they make transistors out of gallium, so I guess I like gallium. Um, potassium, magnesium, there's sodium over there. Uh, a lot of these elements uh, are important to us. And they're important in mineral collecting. Look at this little, little balls of mimetite from Mexico. It is it's lead. Well, lead is made in medium mass stars, but this is an arsenate mineral, arsenic oxide, and chlorine. And chlorine is made in exploding massive stars. So when you look at mimetite, if you have mimetite in your mineral collection or you go to a museum and you see mimetite, it's pretty stuff. Um, you're looking at atoms that were made by the deaths of massive stars. This is one of my favorite minerals. All of the minerals I'm showing you are in my collection and I took the pictures by the way, except for one. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll mention that one to you because it's an interesting mineral. Uh, this is muscovite with pink rubellite. These little rubellite crystals are really pretty under the microscope. And the white stuff here is muscovite. Look at this. There's potassium and aluminum and more aluminum. These atoms were made by the deaths of massive stars. And rubellite is a form of tourmaline, and tourmaline contains potassium and aluminum. So again, potassium and aluminum are made by the deaths of massive stars. FOV here means field of view. So this picture, the field of view here is about 15 millimeters in diameter. So this is a little rock. This is kidwellite, which is one of my favorite minerals, and I had to put it in because it forms these, these ball-shaped things that are really interesting. This is a rock. It's a mineral. It's not a living thing. It's a mineral. Uh, but look at it. It contains sodium, potassium, and oxygen. Uh, those are all made in the deaths of massive stars. The Big Bang couldn't make this stuff. The stars had to make it. So when I look at minerals, I don't think about chemical reactions. I think about the atomic nuclei and how they were made. This is one of my favorite minerals. Uh, this is natrolite and look at the atoms in the formula, sodium, aluminum, silicon, and oxygen. Almost every, well, almost every atom in this mineral was made by the deaths of massive stars. There's water in, there's two molecules of water in this mineral uh, and the hydrogen in water was made in the Big Bang. So um, everything else. So you, if you see any natural light, that's always really pretty crystals. Uh, that's a made stuff made by a supernova explosion. This specimen is about two millimeters in diameter. 
And it was mounted by a, a man named Randy Rothschild who, who lived in Baltimore. He's gone now, but he made beautiful, beautiful micromounts. So whenever I see a micromount made by Randy Rothschild in a sale or in a dealer box, I, I try to get it. Oh, a friend of mine gave me these. This is so weird. This is malachite and it's shaped like mushrooms. I have no idea why. This is a mineral. This isn't living stuff. This is a mineral, but the mineral for some reason is shaped like, like little mushrooms, tiny little mushrooms. This whole picture here has a field of view of maybe, maybe four millimeters. So these are tiny little things, but look at the formula. There's copper and oxygen, and we know that copper and oxygen is made in the deaths of massive stars. This is not a rare mineral, um, and it's not a really tiny mineral. This is almost an inch in diameter. Um, it's chrysocolla. Um, it's really pretty stuff, and it's very, very common. It's, um, you find this in the Southwest where it's dry. But look at the formula, copper, aluminum, silicon, and oxygen. And they're all made in the deaths of massive stars. The only atoms in this mineral that were not made by dying massive stars are the hydrogen atoms. Well, let's look at our list again. Sodium. Sodium is pretty common stuff. Sodium chloride is salt, which I'm not supposed to eat. Um, Sodium is in your body. Uh, you need it in your nerves and muscles. And magnesium, uh, proteins are made with magnesium atoms and you need magnesium in your blood. And it's part of the process that extracts energy. Uh, so your muscles need magnesium atoms. Oxygen makes up 65% of your body. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Oxygen is the most abundant element in the earth. A friend of mine said, no, no, you mean in the crust of the earth because the core of the earth is made out of iron. I said, no, the very core of the earth is made out of iron and nickel, but it's small. The mantle of the earth is made out of rocks and rocks often contain oxygen. And the most abundant atom in the entire earth is oxygen. We use a lot of aluminum, right? Somebody's got to make all those Coke cans out of something. But your body doesn't use aluminum. It's not exactly poisonous, but your body just doesn't use it, doesn't need it. Potassium is important, uh, but it is poisonous. So you don't want too much potassium. Uh, it's used in nerves and muscles. And potassium is part of some medication that people are given uh, to help regulate their heartbeats. Phosphorus is really kind of dangerous stuff, but you need it to make DNA. You know, the DNA molecule is made like a, a ladder with rails and rungs. Those rails are made out of alternating uh, phosphates and sugars. And so you need potassium to make DNA and it gets uh, incorporated into bones and teeth. Your body doesn't contain any arsenic. It's not supposed to. Um, there are probably a few arsenic atoms in there that aren't supposed to be there, but don't mess with arsenic. Um, selenium, you need selenium for enzymes and antioxidants. My wife tells me about antioxidants all the time. I have no idea what they are, but uh, you need selenium for that. And copper, you need copper for good joints and heart, your heart and to make blood. And it also happens to be really good to make copper wire because it's a good uh, electrical conductor. So um, there are huge copper mines all over the world because copper is very valuable. Uh, luckily, it's very common. Uh, and so we can make lots of copper electronics. And silicon, of course, makes rocks. That makes me happy, I'm a rock collector. But it's also used in making bones and joints and tendons and things like that. So we need a lot of those atoms in our body. Mike, now, Mike yes. it's Bronwyn. We have a quick question um, from Bob and I, I think other people might have the same question. So I'm interrupting you. So you're talking about how the elements are created in the stars, but how did they, how did they end up on earth? Oh, 
that's that's a good question and we're almost there oh, okay. but i was there before remember when the when the sun was contracting from the solar nebula and all that gas and dust was in orbit in a disk and the planets began to accumulate from all that stuff that stuff came from clouds of gas and dust in space that had been contaminated with heavy elements uh, by stars that had died before the sun formed. So year by year, the abundance of these elements heavier than helium very slowly increases in the universe. When the sun and planets formed, it was about 2%. It's now up to about 4%. So the atoms, the heavy atoms that we're made of were in the solar nebula when the sun and planets formed. When I think of that, it kind of gives me new respect for the atoms I'm made of. They've been through quite a long history. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. We want to talk about white dwarfs and that's going to get us right to that, that issue of where the atoms in our in our um, in our solar system came from remember that when the sun dies it will blow its surface off into space and the core of the sun will collapse into a white dwarf a white dwarf is mostly carbon a little bit of oxygen it's about the size of the earth but it's about the mass of the sun it is tremendously dense 15 tons per teaspoonful Somebody asked me once if that was a metric ton or what, and I said, I don't care. 15 tons per teaspoonful, you would not want to drop the spoon on your toe. It is tremendously dense, and it's dense because it can't get hot enough to fuse the carbon in the next step. The carbon is a dead end for the sun because it can't get hot enough to fuse the carbon. So these little white dwarfs are kind of like dead stars. They're hot, they're radiating heat and light into space, but they just, they just can't generate any new energy. So they're very, very slowly cooling off. They're dead. But interesting thing, things can happen because about half of all the stars in the universe are double stars. They're two stars that orbit around each other. And if one of those stars dies and leaves behind a white dwarf, as in this picture here, when the other star on the right expands and becomes a giant star, it can lose control of its surface and surface gas can flow over here into a whirlpool around the white dwarf and slowly settle onto the white dwarf. And the white dwarf gets more and more massive, but it can't produce any energy to support itself gets more and more massive until finally it exceeds what is called the Chandrasekhar limit after the man who discovered this. 1.4 times the mass of the sun. At that point, even the atomic forces inside the white dwarf can't keep it from collapsing and the white dwarf collapses. Remember, it's made almost entirely of carbon. And when it collapses, that carbon fuses in nuclear fusion reactions, it explodes. When an atom bomb goes off, the ball of uranium that explodes is, I'm not sure, about the size of a baseball or softball. I don't think it's as big as a softball, maybe a baseball, a little bit bigger. I'm not sure. I don't think the government wants me to know exactly how big it is. That's probably classified, but it isn't a very big ball of uranium that explodes. When this white dwarf explodes, it's the size of the earth and all of the carbon fuses at once. It's an atom bomb the size of a planet, not the size of a baseball, it's the size of a planet. And when it explodes, it produces the brightest supernova there is. All of the carbon fuses at once in tremendous, uh, nuclear reactions that produce all kinds of new atoms. Here's a galaxy with a supernova explosion going off right over here. A supernova can become brighter than all of the other stars in the galaxy put together. 
that's roughly 300 billion stars. I put this in my textbook once and a teacher wrote me a letter and said, that can't possibly be right. And I did the math and I sent it back to him and I said, yeah, it's right. For a day or two, a supernova explosion is brighter than all of the stars in the galaxy. And here's what some of the atoms that these supernovae uh, exploding white dwarfs can produce. More silicon, uh, I love silicon, it makes rocks, and calcium and vanadium and more copper. We need all the copper we can get to make cell phones and zinc and nickel. Oh, but the nickel is nickel 56. That's the wrong kind of nickel because nickel 56 is radioactive. It has a half-life of about a week and it decays into cobalt 56, which is also radioactive. And it has a half-life of just over two months and it decays into iron 56. And iron 56 is good old iron. That's what you make pickup trucks out of and, and patio furniture uh, and skyscrapers, good old iron. That's the iron that we have in the universe. Much of the iron in the universe is produced by exploding white dwarfs. Not quite all of it, but almost all of it is produced by exploding white dwarfs. Let's look at our diagram again. Exploding white dwarfs are the light blue squares. And look up here, there's cobalt, there's nickel, there's copper. The rest of the copper is made by exploding. There's zinc, I like zinc, and um, and more silicon over there, but look in the middle here, there's iron. More than half of all the iron in the universe is made by exploding white dwarfs. And if we look over here, here's titanium and vanadium, chromium, oh, we need a lot of chrome to make cars. Um, yeah, these are, there, there aren't a lot of those elements, are there? But they are important. And here's one of my favorite minerals. This is hemimorphite. Uh, this whole thing is about the size of a dime, a little bit less, a little bit smaller than a dime, but it's a zinc. It contains zinc and silicon. And so the zinc and silicon in here were made by exploding white dwarfs. And this is the specimen that isn't mine. This doesn't belong to me. I took the picture, but it isn't mine. This is the micromount of rosacite. Uh, look at the formula. It's copper and zinc. And we know that copper and zinc are made by exploding white dwarfs. This is an interesting specimen because this specimen was mounted in a little um, micromount box by George Rakestraw, Reverend George Rakestraw. He was a Methodist minister who lived in Cornwall, Pennsylvania at the end of the 19th century. And he is the first person to make micromounts. He bought a really nice microscope. Cornwall had big iron mines and the miners brought out all kinds of beautiful minerals and they would give them to the minister as presents. And he collected minerals and he began to look at them under the microscope and he mounted some of them in little boxes. And so we think of him as the founder of micromounting. So this specimen was mounted probably in the 1870s. So it's about what, 140 years old, 150 years old, something like that. Um, uh, this is part of the collection of historic micromounts that the Baltimore Mineral Society owns. And since I'm the symposium chair, I get to keep that collection in my basement, uh, which is very nice, but it doesn't really belong to me. Oh, I wanted to show you this. Pyrite, you, you, you probably are familiar with pyrite. Pyrite usually forms cubes or big hunks of brassy mineral. It's iron and sulfur. And we know that iron and sulfur is made by exploding white dwarfs. This pyrite is in the shape of a tiny little flag. It is one fifth of a millimeter long. It is so small that when I found this in a dealer box, a, a box of old micromounts, all beat up and broken, and I was going through it with my, with my magnifying glass, I didn't see this at first. It just looked like a white chip of rock. And then it caught a glint of light and I 
really looked at it carefully and I realized this was fantastic. For one thing, it was mounted by Marcel Weber, who is a member of the Hall of Fame, but also it is just a beautiful little bitty pyrite flag. Um, and so I bought it right away, no matter the cost. I paid $2 for it. And it's my favorite. <laughs> I, don't, I don't name my mineral specimens. That would be kind of silly. But I named this one. I named it Tranquility Base. Hey, Mike. Yes. Ellen, Ellen was interested to know, is it possible for the Earth to accumulate any more elements? Um, oh, or yeah. do we have a finite amount? This is it. Other supernovae are exploding. Uh, yep, they're going off all the time. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, planetary nebulae are puffing gas out into space. Uh, all of these processes are producing elements, but the chemical composition of the Earth was fixed four and a half billion years ago when it formed from the interstellar medium. So we don't get any benefit from those others. That's, that's a, a good, good insight to, to notice that. Yeah, we, we've only got what the sun and the planets had when it, when it formed from the solar nebula four and a half billion years ago. Um, I wanted to look at this list again uh, because I wanted to mention that um, um, uh, what, some of these things are useful to us, uh, bones and joints, rocks and teeth. Yeah, we know about calcium, vanadium. You need vanadium in your body for your heart and it's used as a diabetes treatment. And of course we use copper a lot. Zinc makes a great pigment. If you're a painter, you know that zinc oxide, zinc white is a really good paint. It's, it's not as opaque as titanium oxide, but it's a good pigment for some things. Um, something I read said that a deficiency of zinc could give you bad breath. I do not know that I don't know about that. And we use nickel uh, for alloys, and it's important in the manufacture of hormones. And of course, we have to make coins out of it. Um, and we make cars out of iron, but it's also tremendously important in making blood, hemoglobin, and so forth. Now, I want to mention colliding neutron stars because this is, this is very strange. When a supernova explodes, it can leave behind a black hole if it is more than about 40 solar masses. But if it's less massive than that, the supernova can leave behind a neutron star. A neutron star is about, um, a, about 10 kilometers in diameter, tremendously massive, tremendously dense. Um, it is just a ball of neutrons. It is so dense that atoms can't exist. The atoms um, uh, just become a, a, a ball of neutrons. There are binary neutron stars where two massive stars have died and left behind neutron stars. And the neutron stars orbit around each other. And people have discovered in the last decade or so that these orbiting neutron stars produce gravity waves, distortions in space time that travel at the speed of light. And the the gravity waves carry away the orbital energy of the neutron stars. So the neutron stars slowly get closer and closer to each other. They sink toward each other. About once every million years or so in our galaxy, two of these neutron stars get close enough that they merge. They evidently don't like that. Tides rip them apart and there's a tremendous explosion. Uh, they have been given the name kilonova explosions instead of supernova kilonova. Tremendously violent explosions. We haven't seen one of these go off, but we have detected the gravity waves. When I say we, I mean astronomers have, I haven't myself. Um, but we can detect these on Earth. We know this happens. And these explosions produce some interesting elements. Tremendous blast of neutrinos can convert atoms into gold and platinum and silver. You probably like gold, platinum, and silver. Most people do. Rhenium, I'm not really familiar with rhenium. 
thorium is a radioactive element. Uranium is radioactive. Somebody said that they liked plutonium, and that's interesting because plutonium is a really interesting element. And antimony is one of my favorite elements out of all of them. Let me show you some of these. Here's the atomic, here's the uh, periodic table, and merging neutron stars is this orange color. And look at all the elements produced by these explosions. There's iodine. Almost all the iodine in the universe is produced by merging neutron stars. Um, there's iridium, uh, there's gold, and there's silver. Yeah. And, uh, and down here is uranium. Look at that, uranium. It's solid orange. All of the uranium in the Earth was made by merging neutron stars. And there's thorium over here. 90, thorium. Thorium was made by merging neutron stars. And there's plutonium. That's where plutonium comes from, merging neutron stars. If you are a mineral collector, you probably have a uranium mineral. They're often really pretty, yellow crystals, a bunch of different minerals contain uranium. Uh, I hope your uranium mineral is small. Mine are very small, they're microscopic. Uh, so they're safe to use. If you have one as big as your fist, stay away from it. Thorium is radioactive. Th Most thorium minerals aren't very pretty, but I do have a thorium mineral in my collection. It's kind of an ugly little brownish black hunk of stuff, but I've got it. I don't have any plutonium minerals in my collection, and you don't either. There are no plutonium mines on Earth. And this is why I have the half-life of these three minerals down here at the bottom. The half-life of uranium is 4.6 billion years. Well, the solar system formed about 4.6 billion years ago. So half of the uranium atoms that were in the earth when it formed have now converted themselves into lead and other things. The half-life of thorium, look down there at the bottom, the half-life of thorium is 14 billion years. Ah, thorium decays kind of slowly. So there's a lot of thorium left in the earth. It was made by, by, by merging neutron stars, incorporated in the solar nebula, became part of the earth when it formed, and some of it is still around. Plutonium, let's look at plutonium. Plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. <laughs> okay. There was lots of plutonium in the Earth when it formed, I suppose. But the half-life is only 24,000 years, so it has decayed away. There's none left. You can't go out and dig up plutonium rocks. There are no natural minerals containing plutonium. It's all gone. It has such a short half-life, it decayed and it's gone. So that's an interesting mineral. If that's your favorite mineral, that has an interesting story. If you want plutonium for your mineral collection, then you have to make your own. And if you start making plutonium, uh, the CIA is going to want to know where you live. So don't do that. Oh, here's an element that's made by merging neutron stars. Almost all the gold in the universe is made by merging neutron stars. And this is a little crystallized gold piece, really pretty. This is about four millimeters across. And here's a little nugget of platinum. It's not very pretty, but it's platinum. Um, this is a nugget. So it tumbled down a stream for years, bumpity bump, all the way down. And all the pretty crystals were, were worn down. And all that's left is this worn out little nugget. Uh, but that's platinum. That was made by merging neutron stars. And here's autunite. We looked at autunite in the second slide tonight. Uh, but look at the formula again. It contains uranium. And autunite fluoresces. So this is, I'm shining an ultraviolet light on it to take this picture. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty element because it fluoresces. No, normally it's kind of yellow, um, but this, it fluoresces yellow, uh, nice bright green. And belangerite. I told you that antimony was my favorite mineral. And here it is, 
Antimony is lead and antimony and sulfur. It forms little strands and the little strands naturally wrap themselves into rings. And so you can find antimony rings. This ring is about a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. It's a tiny little thing. It's really pretty. So antimony is one of my favorite minerals and it's made by merging neutron stars. Well, here's the list of these elements that are made by ne merging neutron stars. Your body contains about two millionths of a gram of gold. Did you know that? I, I did the calculation. That's enough to form a cube of about two tenths of a millimeter on a side. A large grain of salt from your salt shaker might be that big. Platinum, your body contains quite a bit of platinum uh, and it contains even more silver. But none of these are important. They are not used by your body. And in fact, your silver is a poison and your body is very good at getting rid of it as long as you don't drink too much of it. Um, Rennie, it I'm sorry? Where's your toy? Go get it. Go get your <laughs> toy. Where is it? Did you bring it up? Uh, somebody's playing with their cat. I wish I could see the cat. I have a cat. Here's uranium and thorium. Um, your body doesn't contain any of those. And uranium, your body contains a surprising amount of uranium. It doesn't do anything. It, and it's not really good for you, but uh, it's, it doesn't, you don't contain very much of it. And you don't contain any plutonium because it's all gone. And antimony, well, we use it to make paint and glass and pottery and batteries, but it doesn't occur in your body. Hey, Mike, quick question. Yes. Um, uh, Robert says that we've only known about merging neutron stars for over, a, not very long, a decade or three. Yes. Um, did, did, did they used to think that gold, et cetera, were created by supernovae? Yes, yes. Uh, a few decades ago, that was the lesson that we taught in my astronomy class, that uh, gold and silver must be produced by supernovae because no no other process has enough energy to do that. Uh, but now that uh, we have discovered examples of merging neutron stars, it's clear that those are the things that are producing uh, these, uh, these atoms. Um, that's really an astonishing discovery if, if you have time to read about gravity waves and, and how they can detect them. It's, it's really amazing, a very delicate measurement. And it's, it's just brilliant the way they can do it. And Janina was interested, is the proportion of all the elements um, a chance combination or is there a deeper, more set reason, I guess, proportion in Earth or in wherever they, they tend to accumulate? Yeah, the proportions, uh, that graph that I showed you with all the peaks at the beginning, the abundance of the elements, uh, that tells us something about how the atoms are made. Atoms heavier than iron are, are made by processes that don't occur very often, and so they're rare. Carbon, remember the carbon peak? There's a nice process that produces lots of carbon, and so there's a carbon peak. And there's an iron peak because dying white dwarfs are very common, and they make lots of iron. So uh, yeah, the shape of that curve is fixed by the way the, S, the stars make the atoms. Well, I wanted to tell you about cosmic rays because this is the last way to make atoms. And I needed a picture of empty space. And this is the best picture I could find. Uh, ignore that thing in the foreground. We're not talking about that. Um, and the stars in the background, we're not talking about them either. We're talking about empty space. There's a little bit of gas floating through empty space, mostly hydrogen, but all kinds of other atoms are floating around out there. Typically, the atoms are a few centimeters apart. And there's also cosmic rays. And, when a co and cosmic rays are emitted apparently by supernova explosions. They travel very nearly the speed of light. Most of them are, are protons. The nuclei of hydrogen is a proton. Some of them are neutrons. Um, and some of them are helium nuclei. And one, one of those high energy, really fast cosmic rays hits one of the atoms floating in space. It can, 
produce a, 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 an atomic reaction, it actually breaks the atom into pieces. It's called spallation. It's not fusion. It's, it's knocking the atom into pieces. And some of those pieces are interesting elements. So cosmic ray um, spallation of the gas between the stars can produce some interesting elements. And that stuff is pink in this diagram. See the pink rectangle here, it says cosmic ray fission. Well, it's usually called spallation. And at the top of the diagram, a little bit of lithium is made this way. If lithium is your favorite element, a little bit of it is made by cosmic rays. Beryllium, made by cosmic rays. And boron is made by cosmic rays. I think that's interesting. Uh, boron is a common element in Death Valley. Have you been to Death Valley? That's an interesting place. When the water in Death Valley evaporated, it left behind all kinds of salts. And it turns out some of those salts are rich in boron. And you mine it and you sell it as soap. This is hand soap, but they also made soap to do your laundry with. And they, and they added an O. Borax is um, sodium tetraborate, something like that. It's got a water molecule stuck on it. Um, and it was mined in Death Valley. And you can see uh, this is 20 mule team Boraxo. And there's the 20 mules, 10 pairs of mules pulling a couple wagons full of Borax out of Death Valley. And you, uh, you might be familiar with that because there was a TV show called Death Valley Days. Do you remember Death Valley Days? Oh yeah, oh. Death Valley Days changed the history of America. Cosmic rays made bor boron, which became borax, which they mined to make boraxo. Boraxo sponsored Death Valley Days, and they hired a movie actor who had kind of reached the end of the movie making business. They hired him to be um, their host, and that was Ronald Reagan. And he was very popular as the host of Death Valley Days in 1964. And in 1966, he ran for governor of California. And in 1980, he ran for president. And that's all because of cosmic rays. Here's a specimen from my collection of Colmanite. Colmanite is actually named after the man who discovered um, um, borax in, in Death Valley. And he ran the mine. Um, Here's the formula and there's the B for boron. And this actually didn't come from, from Death Valley. This came from Boron, California. I thought Boron was a town until I used Google Maps to look at it. Boron, California is actually the largest open pit mine in the world. And they mine borates, boron uh, compounds, most, mostly borax out of there. Um, so if, if you are familiar with Google Maps, go and look at Boron, California. It is an amazing hole in the ground. So all of the story I have told you about nucleosynthesis has led us to this. Thanks to nucleosynthesis, we are here. This is where we came from. The stars made us. Now, I would like to take a last couple minutes, if you don't mind, to give you a little bit of perspective because I've given you a lot of facts, but facts aren't understanding. Education isn't about facts, it's about perspective. And I always tried to tell my students that they didn't believe me. So let me give you a little perspective. And to do that, we have to think about a dinosaur, a specific dinosaur. And I suggest we use this dinosaur. He's in the Smithsonian, what's left of him or her. Just to refer to this dinosaur, we need, I think we need to name the dinosaur. So let me name the dinosaur. What shall we call the dinosaur? Um, let's call him, excuse me, let's call him Spot. My first dog was named Spot. Spot the dinosaur. What do we know about Spot? We know that he weighed about three tons. How do I know that? I asked Siri on my phone how much an elephant weighs, and she said it, a large elephant weighs five tons, and I thought Spot isn't as big as a full-size elephant, so he weighs three tons. 
that's about 2.7 million grams. And I looked up the mass of the biosphere. The biosphere is all of the living matter on Earth, plants, animals, birds, fish, germs, viruses, everything. Well, maybe not viruses, everything that's alive. The environmentalists know this number and they argue about it. It is 5 billion billion grams, which is five times 10 to the 18th. And since you're science people, I know you know that that means five followed by 18 zeros. It's a really big number. So if we divide one number by the other, we know that Spock made up one part in 1900 billion of the biosphere. He was a tiny little speck. Now let me talk about your thumb. I know your thumb weighs about 20 grams. How do I know that? I bought a hot dog and I cut off a piece about the size of the thumb and I weighed it, 20 grams. The average atom weighs about 10 to the minus 26 grams. That's a really small number. If I divide one number by the other, I discover that your thumb contains about two billion, billion, billion atoms. Now we have to make an assumption. Everything I've said so far is, is solid science, but we have to make an assumption. And we're gonna assume that when Spock died, he wasn't buried by a lava flow or anything that sealed him up. He, let's, let's just assume that he was walking across a really pleasant pasture one day, a nice meadow, and he had a sudden attack and he just fell over and died. And he decayed there and his atoms were distributed all around the earth. That's really a pretty good assumption because it's been at least 65 million years since Spock died and there's been plenty of hurricanes blowing uh, um, atoms around the earth. So let's just assume that he has been mixed into the biosphere completely. Then that means that one in every 1900 billion atoms in your thumb must have been in spot. Not just in some dinosaur somewhere, but in that particular dinosaur. And that amounts to 1 million billion atoms in your thumb that were in spot. And that's just in your thumb. And that's just in spot. There have been lots of dinosaurs. And, every, and your thumb contains about 1 million billion atoms for every single dinosaur that ever lived. I have no idea how many that is, but I'm pretty sure you're, I don't know you very well. I haven't really seen your thumb, but I'm pretty sure it's not big enough to hold all those atoms. And that must mean that the atoms in your thumb have been inside more than one dinosaur. They have been used over and over and over. The atoms in your body are very old and they have been used for lots of things. They've been in birds and fish and bacteria and, and animals and dinosaurs and bacteria and moss and bacteria. Did I mention bacteria? Your atoms have been inside lots of bacteria. And the first rule of nature is when you're done, you have to give your atoms back because the earth needs them to make other things. And then when the sun dies, remember what I said, when the sun dies, it will vaporize the crust of the earth and blow it into space and it will absorb the earth, destroy the earth. And then it will blow its outer layers out into space as a planetary nebula. And that's where our atoms are going, back into space where they came from to start with. That's called perspective. That's the lesson that I tried to teach my students every semester for 32 years. I think I succeeded a few times. Now I would like to finish by showing you a photograph that I took. I was shopping over a year ago with my wife in a store without masks. That was in the days when you could do that. And I saw something that was so fantastic, I pulled my phone out and I used the camera and I started taking pictures of it. And my wife said, stop that, you're gonna get arrested. That's little girl's underwear. And I said, no, 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 my mineral friends will wanna see this picture. Now that I have your attention, 
this is the picture that I took. These are pajamas for little girls. And yes, little girls are made of stars. And so are you. Thank you very much for listening this evening. I've had a really good time. No, thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was amazing. And my my head feels like a supernova. I feel like I've, it's just, just exploded into a million different pieces um, because every it's just it's just so uh, difficult to get your head around all of all of uh, all of this. But thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions for Mike that we didn't cover uh, during the presentation? That's a lot of information. And my students had 42 class meetings to absorb all of that. But then they had a final exam where you had to do it in an hour, but you don't have a final exam, so that's okay. Um, Robert wants to know why there are gold veins. Gold veins. Gold is actually soluble in hot water very, very slightly. And so, um, the interior of the earth is very hot, water gets heated up and it tends to squeeze up into the cracks in the rock. And when it gets squeezed up, for example, into a crack in some granite or something, uh, the granite is cold and it cools the water and the gold that is dissolved in the, um, in the water is deposited as crystals. Most gold is deposited in crystal form you may see crystal nug uh, gold nuggets, but it's deposited as crystals. And then when the rock breaks down, it frees the gold and some of it falls into streams and little bitty bits and pieces and flakes and gold miners go out there with their pans and they pan for gold. Or people dig into the mountains trying to find those veins where the hot thermal water came up and deposited the gold. There you go. And also, um, why aren't atoms scattered all over? Atoms are scattered all over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not um, sure what, he's, what, what Robert you says. Uh, atoms and elements are scattered. Uh, that's the question. Well, you, you know, there's. Oh, he, you, you answered the question. Oh, right. okay, good. Um, let's see, let's see. Bob wants to know, are you still teaching? And yes, he is because he just taught you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I retired I retired in 02, which is a long time ago. It doesn't seem like very long ago, but I retired in 02, but I still love to give talks like this. And I gave, a talk kind of like this to a group of mineral collectors and afterwards a friend of mine said you know you can't stop teaching and I said yeah I know I can stop anytime I want but I don't want to it's fun it is and now part of your home your homework for everybody here is to take this knowledge and share it with other people because now you know something <laughs> and you need to share it and pass it along. Um, Ellen was interested, will white dwarf stars still go supernova if they're not part of a binary star? No, poor little white dwarfs. If they're, if they're solitary white dwarfs, they will lose their energy and very slowly cool off. And they eventually become black dwarfs that are so cold they don't emit visible light. But they contain so much energy, they're so hot inside, and they're so small, they can't radiate their energy away very fast, and it will take them 100 billion years to get rid of their energy, and the universe isn't that old, so no solitary white dwarfs have died that way yet. They will, but not yet. It's only if they're in a binary star and the other star dumps matter on them that they can actually explode as a supernova. And um, so Mike is part of the Baltimore um, Mineral Society, and you can also join them. They meet at our facility in Overly um, and are kind of, a, you know, we're, we're kind of partner organizations um, in that way. 
Mike, do you want to say anything about that for people who might be interested in getting more involved with the with the BNS? Yeah. We we meet right there in the room uh, in the background, um, but we haven't met for a year because of the virus, and we don't know when we can meet again. But we are having Zoom meetings on the third Wednesday evening of each month, and um, uh, usually we have a program of some kind. Uh, last month, uh, a woman talked about her collection of diamonds, which was very interesting. Uh, she collects little bitty diamonds and mounts them like micromounts. So they're, they're not very expensive, uh, but she has a big collection. She's won prizes for her diamond collection. Um, so I don't know what the program is this month. Um, uh, sometimes people just talk about their rocks because it's so much fun to hold up a rock and talk about it. Um, but uh, we have a meeting on the third Wednesday evening. And if you want to know more about it, uh, you could send me email or, or um, uh, do a Google search for Baltimore Mineral Society and you'll turn up our web page. And uh, someone asked um, that the, the, um, the image that you have of the periodic table with all of the star um, uh, origins on it, can we make that shareable? Um, can you email that to me and I can share it with folks because people are interested in it. Uh, where, did you, where did you get it? Or? It's from a magazine article and uh, the, in the American Scientist. And in fact, that diagram was drawn by one of the two women who, who compiled all of the information to make the diagram, uh, two astronomers. They actually went to lunch one day and were sitting around and they took a napkin and started drawing a periodic table. And, uh, and they said, why doesn't anybody color code this thing? And so they did it. Um, and so that's in that magazine article. Um, you said you're going to record this and put it out there. I don't suppose we will get in trouble for including that in our program, um, uh, but it is in, in a copyrighted magazine article. Um, so I, I don't suppose we can print it and hand it out as leaflets. Right, well, that gives people a, um, a clue to go look for it, I guess, that's fine. Um, let's see. Yes, we have saved this video. It will be available on our YouTube channel and you can go back and see my um, micro mineral uh, talk, which is also there if you wanna learn more about that. Um, I hope that you will join us for some more uh, talks coming up every Thursday. Uh, you'll learn something new right here, same time, same channel. Uh, you get that curiosity muscle built up and get that information where you can share it out like a, like an exploding star and get all that good, uh, those good uh, information out there for your own supernova. Um, I'm never going to look at my thumb the same way and <laughs> or the universe. So thank you again. I hope that um, we can figure out a way to keep learning from you, um, Mike, and maybe we'll be able to go on some field trips too in the near future and look for some, some rocks and minerals. That would be cool. Um, and thank you all. Robert wanted to know, is the Webb telescope gonna change the game? Yes, okay. yes, certainly. It's, it's a fantastic instrument and uh, they're gonna see a lot more galaxies that we can't see now. All right, with that, everybody stay safe, um, stay curious, and if you want to join us tomorrow for our Founders Day presentation, you can uh, log on and, uh, and register for that event. Thank you again, uh, Michael. Everybody stay safe and stay curious. We'll see you soon.